Hey everybody, my name is Danielle and I want to welcome you to our virtual campus. I am so excited to have you here with us today and I am definitely excited about this new series, This is Kingdom, where we'll learn about the king, the kingdom, as we navigate through our everyday lives. Listen, life gets hard, right? But we know that we have a savior, friend, and king who overcame all of it. And that's exactly why we're here. So with that said, let's get ready to enjoy service and enjoy us from wherever you are. This series is a catalyst to our city changing, shifting unto kingdom rule. Yeah? Oh my God, make some noise, somebody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So everybody bring their notebooks. Got your notes. You ready to take notes today? Amen. Like this, as we kick off this series, it's going to be a lot of information, a lot of information that we want to share with you. Um, so I want to make sure that you got it. Amen. Yes. We believe in no saint being left behind. Well. So I want to make sure you got it. Now, now hear this. This isn't, this teaching just isn't for you just to hear on Sunday morning. You got to go and study and show yourself approved yourself. Yes. Amen. Because in the morning, you're probably only going to retain about 10, 20% of what I'm saying. Yeah? So you have to take notes. You got to go home. You got to dig in the word yourself. My, if you probably heard the things that I've been saying, I keep encouraging you. Go read it for yourself. Go read it for yourself. Amen? So we're going to dig in. This is week three of our new series, This is Kingdom. Now, in this series, we're going to learn a few things. We're going to learn. That Jesus, we're going to learn what Jesus taught. What Jesus taught and how to apply that to our life. That's what we're learning in this series. Very simple. We're learning what Jesus taught and how to apply that to our life. The reason we're teaching this is because many of us don't even know what Jesus was taught. Amen. Let's agree with it. Many of us don't know what Jesus was taught. Been in church our whole life. And don't know what Jesus taught. Many of us don't even know what he said. But Jesus said, I was sent to earth to teach this message. I was sent to earth to teach this message, for that is why I was sent. But then people are like, well, I thought Jesus came to set the captives free. I thought Jesus came for freedom, to abolish sin. Yes, absolutely, he did. But that's just part of the story. That's just part of the story. That's just part of why Jesus said he came. The reason he came, he said, that's just part of the reason. So he says, yes, I did all that based off this message I was teaching. Based off this message I was teaching. Now watch this, Luke 4. Everybody turn to Luke 4. Luke 4, 42. Jesus was saying, I was sent here to teach this message and to demonstrate that this message is true. I was sent here to teach this message and to demonstrate that this message is true. What we learned last week. So we're going to start here with Luke 4, 42. Early the next morning, he went out into the desert. The crowd searched everywhere for him to talk about Jesus. And when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave, but to stay in Capernaum. Verse 43 says, but he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other places too. For that is why I was sent. What they were saying is, listen, Jesus, we want you to stay here. Keep teaching us. Keep performing miracles. We, we want to keep you all to ourselves. And Jesus said, wait a minute. I've come. I got to go because my purpose here on this earth, why I was sent, was to teach this message was to go and teach the good news of the kingdom of God to everyone I can tell it to. It says, that's why I was sent. Jesus was saying, I have a responsibility. My responsibility on this earth is to teach this. That's why God, that's why God put me here. Now, I believe that lets me know that that's important. That that was important to Jesus. The most important thing at that moment was teaching this. Correct? I believe what's important to Jesus 
should be important to us. Do you agree with that? That what's important to Jesus should be important to us. What's important to his teaching, what's important, why he taught this, that this is the most important thing that I'm doing. You should make that important as well. Now, the problem is, it's not important to the church today. It's not. Why do I say that? Because half of us don't even, have never heard this teaching. Which means it's not important enough to teach. My, look, somebody said, my Lord. Yes. It's not important to, enough to teach, so we don't teach it. But if Jesus said, this is the most important thing that I'm doing, I think, we should, I think we should make it important in our life as well. Even Paul, watch this. Even Paul in, in, in Colossians 3.16, he said, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and gather for worship and praise. We talked about that last week. Why do you gather to teach this message? Why do you gather to worship and praise and to teach this message? That's what Paul said. Now, Background history, Paul received a message, I'm just recapping, Paul received a letter saying, hey, Paul, people are leaving the church. They're not staying. They're falling away from the faith. There's something strange in the teaching. It's, I don't, we don't think it's the same thing that Jesus was teaching. Can you tell us what we're supposed to do as a church? This is Paul. Can you tell us what we're supposed to do as a church? Paul responded with this letter. Saying, okay, look, what you do when you gather, you, you, you teach the kingdom of God. You teach what Jesus taught. He says, Anything, everything that you do, let that message dwell in you richly as you worship and pray. The rest of the scripture talks about whether you dance, you sing, you shout, you jump, you run around, you paint, whatever you do. The kingdom message needs to flow richly through that. When you choose your songs to sing, the kingdom message needs to flow freely through that. Richly. As you dance, the kingdom message needs to be flowing richly through that. As you teach and preach, the kingdom message should be flowing richly through that. He said the message of Jesus. What's the message of Jesus? The kingdom message. The kingdom message. Everybody say amen. Amen. I'm just giving you some history. Now... If everything we do is supposed to, the church, if everything that we do is supposed to come from this message, this understanding, then why don't we do it? Why don't we teach it? Mm, y'all going to hear God today. Why don't we teach it? Throw some answers out. Why don't we teach it? You don't know. Why is this not an important message in the church? Fear, it's not important. Even us planning to teach this message, the response that I heard from people, like, man, we're going to teach this message about the kingdom. Uh, That's crazy. They start Xing out days on the planet center. Like, ah, yeah, he ain't talking about trauma no more. He ain't talking about the blessings I can get. You ain't talking about the things I can get with from the Lord. You ain't talking about how things are going to be all right with me. You ain't going to talk about those things. You're talking about the kingdom, what Jesus talked about. Uh, Can you add a little prosperity in there? That's crazy. I'm I'm, I'm dead serious. I I talk to people on purpose just to see their response. Like, man, so what do you think about this new new series? Uh, Oh, but when we was talking about trauma, look, trauma, yes, yes, we all deal with trauma. But the way we can process trauma is because of this message. The reasons you have benefits, the prosperity things, is because of this message. But you can't receive these things unless this message is taught and you understand it and you can walk in it. Oh, somebody yell out, dig deeper. Dig deeper, dig deeper. Our goal and purpose as a church should be, I'm going to say should, should be to teach the good news of the kingdom. It should be. We should be teaching what Jesus taught. 
That's what it says. That's what Paul, how, that's how he started the churches. That's what Jesus said. You should be teaching what I'm teaching. Constantly we say, man, we want to be more like Jesus. But we don't teach what he taught. We want to be more like Jesus when it benefits us. We want to be more like Jesus when it benefits us. When, when I can make a withdrawal from the kingdom. That's when it's good. But this kingdom teaching, there's a lot of uncomfortable conversations. And that's what we don't, we don't want to talk about. Our goal as a church, biblically, read it, study, study, show yourself approved. Our goal is, one, to teach who the king is, what his kingdom looks like, how his kingdom operates, what the king desires of this world, and what that means for you. I know this sounds crazy, but churches don't teach that. Raise your hand if you've ever heard this teaching. I mean, if you've been here, yeah, but raise your hand if you've ever heard this. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Raise your hand if you've ever heard this teaching outside of this building. The mighty few. Oh, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's a, that, oh, that's a big problem. But the reason we don't teach it, because it doesn't cater to the feelings of the listener. Mm. The kingdom message is probably the most humbling messages in the word. The kingdom message is all, listen, watch this. The kingdom message is all about you understanding your life, your world, and your everything is not about you. I'll say it again. The kingdom message is all about your life, your world, your everything, not being about you. But it's all being about the glory, the, the glory unto God. Most people don't want to talk about that. Because we come to church to get something for us. We listen to messages to get something for us. But not to get something for the king. Mm, We're going to talk. We're going to talk this. I'm just laying, laying some groundwork. Kingdom message is all about the king. We can't handle that message because we're selfish. We're selfish. We, I'm saying we, me too. We're selfish. Mm. The kingdom message is all about not my will, but your will be done. The kingdom message is all about, listen, I... I don't have a say-so in what God wants to do. I just get to play a part in it. The kingdom message is, I don't get what I want. I get what God wants. Wait a big difference. The kingdom message is, I don't live for me. I live for him. The kingdom message is, everything that I got ain't for me. Everything I got is for him. Every blessing, everything that comes into my life is not for my glory. It's for his glory. And that's why we don't teach that. We don't teach it because that makes people uncomfortable. We like to teach messages. I'm talking about the church. We like to teach messages that gets butts in the seats. Yeah. That's what the church has turned to. The church has turned into, let me teach a message to fill these seats up. Let me teach a message, like, man, if you do this, you'll get a new car. If I tell that enough, more people come, and they'll fill the seats. Fill the seats more time. I'm, I'm going to expose. Can you say expose the church? Expose the church. Ex expose the church. The kingdom message is, it don't matter who there, you just teach this thing. And I'll take care of you. Yes, yes. The kingdom message makes people uncomfortable. The kingdom message doesn't cater to your feelings. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't cater to your feelings. The kingdom message is, there's a kingdom. This is how this works. Well, God, I feel, I don't care. It ain't about how you feel. It's about how I feel. That, that's the kingdom message. The kingdom message doesn't cater to what you want. The kingdom message, watch this, the kingdom message 
it talks about how this is not, our God is not a king who operates in a democracy. Democracy means you can vote and make changes in that kingdom. If you don't like how things go, you gather enough people, you vote, and things change. Kingdom message is our king likes to rule as an absolute monarchy. He's a king. He makes decisions, and everybody in this kingdom got to abide by it. If you want the benefits of said kingdom, you got to abide by it. If you do not, if you do not abide by it, then you don't get the benefits of living in that kingdom. And God says, you have a choice whether you want to live here with me or not. Well, God, I, 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 I want to decide. I want my life to do, to, to do this and this and this, and I want authority to do this and this and this. He's like, oh, yeah, you don't do that. You don't get that. You get the benefits of what my kingdom has. You don't get to decide how I rule. Oh, wait a minute. She laughed. She laughed. But I'm, I'm, what's crazy is we believe that. You don't get to decide how I lead and how I rule. That's the kingdom message. Jesus went around teaching that. He said, hey, there's a king, and he decides all things, and he rules over all things. And we just play a part in that. Now, that's a humbling thing. Like, oh, man, you're just servants of this king. But he loves you enough to allow you to be in the kingdom. Mm, someone say, go deeper. Go deeper. Now watch this. Because most churches and pastors and leaders, they, 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 they don't want to teach this. They won't teach it, probably because they don't know. And, all, and other reasons is because they just don't want to talk about it. Because it doesn't cater to the seeker-friendly church. Seeker-friendly church says, come as you are, stay as you are. God will always love you. Come as you are, stay as you are. God will love you. He understands. There's grace and mercy. That's the secret friendly message. But then the kingdom message is, yeah, come as you are, make a decision to follow the king and shift your ways. Yep. Yep. Two different things. Two different things. The secret friendly message is, come as you are. You know what? I know you deal with this. You can stay right there. God loves you. You always have a place in heaven. You always have a place in heaven. He's the king. He loves you. He has love, un unconditional. Keep doing what you're doing. But then Paul said, nah, you can't live that way in the kingdom. He said, what, what was the words he used? God forbid. Wait a minute. Who forbids? God forbids that you stay in a certain lifestyle once you've accepted the kingdom. Bids. Oh my God. So watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. I love this. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Now, churches won't teach this, but didn't, watch what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Precursor to what the scripture says. Jesus, mm, I feel my help coming. Jesus was just resurrected from the grave. He was just resurrected from the grave. It just happened. Mary and, 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 and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they were both there. They saw Jesus. He's resurrected. Oh, my God. It's real. And Jesus, Jesus tells them, I need you to go. Go to Galilee. Or tell, tell the disciples, meet me in Galilee. The king is alive. Go tell them. So what did they do? Mary, Mary Magdalene and Mary, they went, to, they went to the disciples. And they told them. Here's what they told them. Listen, y'all, we went to the tomb. He's not there. Jesus is alive. He proved that he's God and king. The king proved his authority over the earth. He is not there. He's alive. And he wants to meet you and talk to you. That was the message they went and talked. Can we sidebar for a second? The first people to preach the gospel of the kingdom after the resurrection were two women. Can we go down this path for a second? 
the first two people to preach Jesus is real he, and he's, he's alive and the king has been resurrected were two women. What does it say? The scripture, I didn't make it up. The scripture says that there was the first two people and they went and told the disciples. Two women went and preached to the disciples, said, hey, Jesus really lived, he really died, really rose from the grave, he's really king. He's here and he wants to meet you. That's the kingdom message. They went and preached the kingdom, two women. Y'all, I don't think God does things by happenstance. I don't think he does things by happenstance. He keeps proving, proving that everybody's accepted. Everybody has authority. Regardless of what your gender is. Everybody's accepted. I know, I don't want to go down this path too far, but I'm, I'm going to go down even further. I, there's a, there's a, some of one of my favorite scriptures is John 4. Favorite story is about the woman at the well. He was talking to the woman at the well. He prophesied to her, told her, uh, you know, he, did, he told her she got to change her life. She, the scripture says she goes to the town, quick summary. She goes home and she begins to tell everybody about Jesus. Hey, I met this man. He is really the Messiah. He prophesied it to me. He changed me. He forgave me. It's really the Messiah. He's real and he's here. The kingdom has come upon us. The scripture says the whole town believed without seeing. Another instance of a woman having an encounter with Jesus and preaching to her whole neighborhood. And it says they believe without seeing. Yes, sir. It ain't always got to be a man. Women, you have the ability to shift the course of this world. He's anointed you just like he's anointed me. You have the same power and authority that I have. Same power. The commandment, oh my God, we're going to a place I don't really want to go, but the command of the Lord was for Adam and Eve, both of them, to rule, to govern together. Together, meaning that the same authority was bestowed upon both of them. Because if the authority was bestowed upon Adam and she was a part of Adam, then that same, they both had the same authority because they're the same person. Okay, we'll, we'll preach on that. I, I know that's, we're going into the mystic world, to the secrets of the Lord, but we're, okay, we're, let's go back. Let's go back. So, come on, we got we to gotta get this message. He doesn't do anything <laughs> by happenstance. Now, Mary and Magdalene, he went, they went and told the disciples this. Now, here's where the story starts. Matthew 28 says, Jesus undeterred, undeterred, meaning he wasn't distracted. He was very clear in thought. It says, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. Now, what is happening? The disciples showed up to Galilee. Jesus is standing there. They're like, oh, oh, oh my God, you're alive. You're alive. And it says Jesus, undeterred, without saying anything else, went right ahead and gave him a charge. Wasted no, this, what that scripture is saying, he wasted no time. It says, God authorized and commanded me to commission you. God gave me the authority and he gave me and he commanded me to tell you this, to give you a mission, to give you your purpose. And he's saying, hear me clearly. The words say, go out and train everyone you meet. That's the scripture. We use the term disciple. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near, everywhere you can go. In this way of life. What way of life? The kingdom way of life. Because mind you, th th these are the disciples. He knows them. They know what he was teaching. So he didn't have to go into detail. Your purpose and your destiny is to go out and preach the same message I preached. It says, marking them by baptism in the, in the threefold name, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It says, go and preach the good news of this king. And when you preach the good news of this king, just like I did, this needs, there needs to be signs and wonders that follow this. And when you teach this, I'm going to be with you and bringing forth signs and wonders so that they are encouraged to believe. The scripture says, when they believe, help them make a public declaration. Help them make a, an announcement to the world that now Jesus is their Lord, that they recognize Jesus as king. That's what baptism is. It's, a, it's, it's an outward expression of an inward change. He said, make sure that they make this outward expression. It's so important. Why? Because the scripture also says, if you deny me in public, I'll deny you. 
Is that not what it says? We're going to talk about what the word says. So he's like, I need them to make a public declaration that I'm Lord, that I'm king. Don't just believe it in your heart, but make sure, make sure that the world knows that I'm your king. The world knows. Now, the scripture goes on to say, because he said, here's your commandment. Here's, here's what your purpose is. Then instruct them in the practice of all I commanded you. Uh-oh. Instruct them in what I commanded you. So it says, tell them about the kingdom and instruct them on how to live as kingdom ambassadors. How do I know this? Because we talked about it last week. Jesus says, I'm the door. So he's saying, tell them about the door. And when they get to the door, tell them what to do when they go through the door. Remember, Jesus said, I'm only the door. I'm only the way. I'm only the way to the kingdom. Once they understand the way and they get there, your instruction, your purpose, and your destiny is to teach them what to do when they go through the door. Mm, someone shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now watch this. Watch this. He says, instruct them what to do when they go through the door. The next line says, I'll be with you as you do this. Day after day after day, right up until the end of the age. Uh-oh. So that he gave a time frame. So how long are we supposed to be teaching this? Forever. Until this ends. How long are you supposed to be teaching his message? Forever. What is your purpose? To go teach this message. And train them in this message. How long are you supposed to do this? Forever. Forever. The problem is, we can't even get to this point because churches aren't teaching this. We aren't discipling people in this. We disciple people in how to love people. Love everybody. Jesus loves you. Love everybody. But then they're still lost. I don't have a purpose. I don't know what to do with my life. But I'm loving everybody. I just, I love, I love you, but I don't, I don't know who I am. I don't have an identity. That's why, be, ooh, thank you, Holy Spirit. When you don't know your identity, you try to find your identity in other things. When you don't know your identity, you try to find your identity in other things. Because the church has not, and I'm going to say this very boldly, because the church has not been teaching identity, that's why we have so many identity crises going on in the world. Come on. Come on. Where people are like, look, I identify as this because I don't know my identity. But then the scripture says in Genesis what you should identify as. I created you in my image. I created you in my image, so that's your identity. Your identity is me. You don't have to find it anywhere else. But because the church does not teach this, we find it in other places. We find our identity in relationships. We find our identity in substance abuse, whatever it is. We find our, our identity, some people, uh, very simple, some people find their identity in just being the funny guy in the room. If I can just be funny, then people will like me. If I can just be the one that, people, that gets everybody's attention, they may like me. So you find your identity in that, and God's like, look, I gave you an identity. You don't have to look for it. You don't have to work for it. I gave it to you. I wasn't looking for a lot of amens today because we're just we're teaching the truth here. Now, here's the problem. This message is not being taught in your small groups. It's not being taught in churches. It's not being taught in the ministry meetings. It's not being taught in conferences. We'll go to conferences to learn how to prophesy, but not learn how to be kingdom. We go to conferences to learn how to worship, but not learn how to be kingdom in our worship. It's like this, this, this teaching is like missing in the things that we do. It's, it's omitted. It's like it's crossed out. Our, our response should always be, well, what does the king want? What does the king say? Okay. Now, watch this. Here's, here's, where, here's, here's where God really wrecked me. He said, uh... In John 14, 15, 
John 14, 15, this is what he says. If you love me, keep my commands. So how do you prove that you love the Lord? By keeping his commands. What's his commands? He explained it to the, to the disciples. My commands is this, is this teaching. And live by this teaching. Love is a part of that teaching. But it ain't the whole thing. So if you love me like you say you do, then this, should, this teaching should be richly in your life. It should be rich in your life. How you talk should come from this lens. How you live should come out of this lens. How you do ministry should come from this lens. If you love me. Now, this ain't one of the disciples that said this. This is Jesus. If you love me like you say you do, then this should be your conversation. There's a lot of people who say they love God, but this isn't the conversation. There's a lot of people who say they love God, but choose self before choosing him. And then God says, well, that's not showing you love me. We don't teach kingdom because the message of the king is counterculture. The message of the king is counterculture. The kingdom message is intended to go against the culture of the world. I'll say it again. The kingdom message is intended to go against the culture of the world. Jesus even said the culture of the world and the kingdom of God are two separate things. They do not mix. He said this. He said this in John 18, 36. Jesus said, he says two clear statements. One, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Culture and my kingdom are two separate things. Oil and water. They do not mix. My kingdom is not of this world. It's above this world. It's, it's bigger than this world. My kingdom created this world. So what the world decides to do in it, that's the culture is not the kingdom. But the problem is today the culture tries to lead the kingdom. Uh-oh. What did he say? Wow, well, we're going to go there. What did he say? He said, the kingdom is not of this world. In the part two of this, of, of this statement he made, Jesus said, my kingdom is not from here. My kingdom is not from here. What I do is not based off what the world does. So culture can't decide what I do. Culture can't decide what the church does. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Culture can't decide how the church teaches. But for some strange reason, nowadays it does. Culture says, you can't teach on this, this, and this, and this, because people are going to be offended. But then Jesus says here, culture cannot decide what you teach. Culture cannot decide what you do. Culture does not decide what your worship looks like. Culture can't decide what you should wear to church. Uh Uh-oh. Come on. I'll say it again. Culture can't decide what you wear to church. Culture can't decide what you teach. Culture can't decide how you love people. Because culture says we should love people and accept everything that goes on in their life. But then the kingdom says love people but don't accept what goes on in their life. Two completely different things. Culture says you should be the salt of the earth. So if something goes on outside of what the kingdom says, you should be the one to say something. I love you. I'm saying it because I love you enough to say it. That's real love. Real love, the scripture talks about love isn't isn't puffed up. Love is not supposed to make you feel good. Love, Love means I care about you. But the way I care about you ain't going to always make you feel good because I I may say some things to keep you out of trouble. I may say some things to help you get back in alignment with the Lord. That's love. If I just allow you to do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it outside of the will of God, I don't love you. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. The people I keep around me, I make sure that they tell me the truth. Hey, don't leave me out here stinking. Right, right, right. 
Bro, if I'm musty, say something. Don't talk about me to everybody else. Like, bro, he musty. No, say something. Stop at CVS, grab me some deodorant. Like, hey, bro. Get you together. I never forget. <laughs> we got to move on. I never forget. God just put this in my mind. We, um, I had to go lead worship in, in Frankfort, Kentucky. I brought a few people here. And uh, we sang. I was sweating all crazy. And we had just did service, too, that morning. It was a whole bunch going on, and then we went and sang. So I was already sweaty. Boy, I was reeking. I was reeking. And then first myself, I was like, oh, I ain't that bad. I ain't that bad. Like, you know, and then I just minister. People understand. Hey, I walked off stage. <laughs> Jasmine Brown, she's sitting over here. She said, um, you stink. I said, what? And I laughed. Like, ah, you, you so silly. She said, no, like, you really stink. Like, you really need to do something about that. I went and took a bird bath in the bathroom of, the, of this venue. But, but I appreciated that because it shows that she loves me. Because she could have just not said nothing. And it wasn't in malice. I felt that she cared. I felt that she cared on, on, on how people perceive me. We're in a foreign land. Representing the kingdom of God. And don't let that, don't let how you smell be a distraction. Come on, that's the word. That's a major word. Don't let how you smell be a distraction. Because some of us smell like a lot of things. Some of us smell like sex. Some of us smell like weed. Some of us smell like anger. Some of us smell like bite, backbiting. Yeah. Don't let the way you smell. Yeah. Yeah. Hinder your witness. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. Tell your neighbor, don't let me stink. <laughs> don't let me stink. Jesus' message was counterculture. He was actually known as a politically incorrect king. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Jesus was known as the politically incorrect king. Everything he did was against the politics of the world, was against culture. It was against culture. He won for the foolishness. He won for making people feel good. He was about what the king said, and that was it. Now watch this. That was why they crucified him. They didn't crucify him because he talked about loving everybody. You should love everybody because God loves you. Why would they crucify him? They, they was like, oh, that's good. That makes me feel good. I'm so glad that you told me that. But the moment they decided to crucify him was when he started saying, I'm king. The moment they decided to crucify him was when he was like, yeah, the kingdom of God runs this way and y'all out of order. That was when they was like, uh-uh, 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 crucify him. The moment they decided to crucify him was when he started teaching his kingdom message. That there's a king and he has authority over you and this whole world. They're like, oh, no, no, crucify him. Because we need things to... They, their decision to crucify him was to silence him. It was to silence this conversation. It was to silence what he was saying. If we can kill him, he can't tell people about kingdom anymore. Because he was going around telling people... Yeah, I know y'all got all these titles, but that means nothing. You are no greater than the doorkeeper. Your, your shepherd title is no greater than the janitor. Your shepherd title is no greater than the parking lot attendant. They didn't like that. I know the word. Yep, but you are no greater than the person here on the street. They said, we're going to silence that. Because we the church, we won't. We want to do what we want to do. We want to make the laws. We want to decide how the church goes. And he's like, yeah, you don't decide that. The king does. Yeah. Listen to how he responded. Watch how he responded. Bible read. You got to read. He walked in the church and was like, 
He started tossing stuff. Pretty much telling them, like, uh, uh, this is not what we do. Y'all say y'all are, y'all, y'all, y'all are kingdom people and y'all, y'all love the Lord, but this is not what we do at church. His point was like, what are y'all doing? So they said, we got to silence him. We, can't, we got to silence this guy. Ooh, Lord Jesus, it's 1230. I mean, okay. <laughs> we got to silence this guy. So they said, crucify him. If we crucify him, we get to continue to do what we want. If we crucify him, if we crucify him, we get to get our way. If we crucify him, then we, it, we get to follow our agenda and not his. Crucify him. Now watch this. Why does the church, why does the church not teach this message? Because they're still saying crucify him. They're still saying silence the message. But we use a different phrase now. Cancel them. Well, this is not of the Lord. Cancel. This is not what God wants. Cancel. They're trying to shut the church up. The culture is trying to shut the church up. You can't talk about homosexuality and gender, blah, 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 and LGBTQ, whatever. You can't talk about it or they're going to cancel you. It's another tactic to silence the word of God. They're still yelling, crucify him. Because the moment, and I I call that out, but it's everything. The moment you push against what culture wants to do, they're still yelling, crucify him. We just came from Palm Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. Palm Sunday, they, they glorified God as king. Oh, the king has arrived until he opened his mouth. Until he started putting people in a place. Until he started bringing correction. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, crucify that. Mm-mm. Nope. Our culture doesn't want that. Now, hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this. When the voice of the culture becomes louder than the voice of the king, the, the body of Christ has failed its mission. Yes, Lord. When the voice of the culture becomes louder than the voice of the king, the body of Christ has failed its mission. We are totally out of alignment with what God called us to do. What did he call us to do? To teach this message. If, we, if you don't teach this message and you listen to the culture, you are out of alignment. Jesus thought it was so important that when he rose, that was the first thing he told him. It said, undeterred. Listen, 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 listen. I know y'all excited that I came back, but y'all have to hear this from me. You need to teach this message and teach it to all the world. Make sure everybody hears this message that there's a king and this and his kingdom is bigger than what's going on in this world. And everybody in it is a part of that. And they have and and I have authority over it. And everybody in here has to live under this kingdom. Teach people this message. Mm. Teach people how to live in the kingdom. That's where the message of the church has stopped over years. We teach people Jesus, but then we don't teach people how to live in the kingdom. We teach people about the king, which is great. But we don't teach people about what the king desires for us. I ain't going to be able to teach this whole thing today. We'll come back to it. But watch this. The kingdom message... The kingdom message that Jesus taught, I said it last week, so if you didn't write it down, you can write it down today. This is what Jesus' message was. But here's the kingdom message. It's very simple. God said, make sure it's, you say it in a very simple way so that people understand. Because you, you got to ask, if we sit there talking about kingdom, then what was Jesus teaching? How do you explain it? Here's the message. God reigns through God's people over God's creation. That was Jesus, what Jesus taught. Jesus taught God reigns through God's people over God's creation. I'll say it again. God reigns through God's people over God's creation. And Jesus came and he demonstrated that. He came as a man to demonstrate that the authority of God can reign through man over all creation. That was his point. His whole point of living was to demonstrate this truth, that God reigns. 
and he can reign through his creation, through man, over everything. Now, that was his message, and people didn't like that. They didn't like that. Now, when you, when you, when you hear that, you have to ask, why? Why would Jesus come and teach that? He was expecting something to happen when he taught it. Think about the disciples and what he taught them. Everything he said, there was an expectation that Jesus always had. What's the expectation? We call that expectation the agenda of the kingdom. The agenda of the kingdom. The agenda of Jesus' teaching. Why did he teach it? What happens when the kingdom message is learned and applied? That there is visible demonstration of God's reign through God's people over all creation. He taught this so that there continues to be visible demonstration of God's reign yep. through God's people over God's creation. He uh, I'm going to have to summarize some of the things I'm going to say, but I'll, I'll go deeper next week. But that's the plan of God. The plan of God is that there continues to be here in the earth, hear me, visible demonstration, experiential demonstration of God's reign through God's people over all God's creation. Jesus did that. His whole life was an example of God reigning through God's people, through God's children, through creation, over everything. And he said, I have an expectation of you that you do the same. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. His plan has been the same. His plan, watch, I, 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 I got to read you the scripture. Jesus laid out his plan. He laid out his plan. He said, greater works shall you do. Greater works shall you do. He was telling them. He says, it was John 14, there it is. John 14, 12 through 14. He says, verily, verily, I, say, I tell you, whoever believes in me and believes in his teaching would do the works I've been doing. If you believe this message, that's why it's an expectation. He taught it so that you can believe it. If you believe this message, you will be able to do what I did. Because another scripture says, because the same power that lives in me lives in you. That's what he was trying to explain to people. If you believe, if you believe, you can do the same I've, I've done. It doesn't matter that I'm God. The same authority the Father has given me, he has now bestowed upon you. A lot of theologians like to call it delegated authority. The authority given to Jesus, Jesus said, now I'm giving it to you. I'll explain it next week. But it says, verily, verily, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And then it says, not just that. If you thought what I did was dope, it says, then you will be able to do greater than these. Because I'm going to the Father. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You'll be able to do greater works because the same authority that conquered the grave lives in you. And so Jesus was saying, this is what you need to teach people. Churches should be teaching people that I'm king and I have authority over everything and I've given that authority to you. Yes. Yes. That was his message. Yes. I have authority over all things and I'm giving it to you. But because we don't teach this, we don't take authority. That's like somebody hiring you for a job but didn't tell you you was a CEO. You just in the mailroom and everybody else around is looking like, why, why, did, why is she down there? Undercover boss. They, you don't know that you're the CEO. Well, I'm going to say VP. You don't know you're the VP. You're the vice president. You were given delegated authority from the CEO. But we don't operate in it because we don't know. We don't. Nobody teaches us this. And don't you believe that that's the plan of the enemy? The plan of the enemy is to get you to not hear that you have authority. 
The plan of the enemy is to get you to not hear that God has bestowed upon you the same power that conquered the grave lives in you. What does that look like? Because he said you could be able to do, the scripture says you'll be able to do what I did. Meaning, what did he do? When he saw people get, when he saw people sick, Father, in the name of Jesus, you shall be healed. That's authority. Because authority, he said, over man and the world. So there's nothing that happens here that God doesn't have authority over. He said, my kingdom is above this. It's beyond this. So if I see something that does not align with what this kingdom says, I can call it out. My, when I started to understand this, my prayer life shifted. I stopped asking. I stopped asking. I remember um, Sister Argulin, she came up here one day. We were doing a prayer line. And uh, she said, I want you to pray for me. You remember that? She said, I want you to pray for me. I'm like, ah. I don't know what to say, but I learned that I have authority. So I grabbed her arm. I'm gonna tell, tell me, tell me if I'm lying. I grabbed her arm, and I'm just trying to figure out what do you want me to do. And God was like, "Oh, there's pain there." And He left it. I was like, "Oh." I said, "Okay, well." I said, "With the authority of heaven bestowed upon me, heal." Amen. I didn't have a shantanda boshi. I didn't have none of that. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have no, none of the extra church and East stuff. That's not needed for God to move. Come on. That's another message for another day. And I left it. Be, it was a two second prayer in the name of Jesus. And then because I understand authority, I didn't even ask what happened. She walked away. I said, amen. She said, amen. She walked away. She came back the next week. She said, but Troy, and she right there, you can ask her. She said, uh, you, I had a lot of pain in my arm that day. And you touched it, and it's gone. Is that not what happened? I don't have to seek for a report of the Lord when I know my authority. Because I already know the report of the Lord. But that's operating in authority, operating in what God, you, listen, when you operate in authority, see now, see I got kids. This is why praying over your food and over your car and travels is so important. The world says you don't need to do that no more. That's why we're stopping. You, you don't see a lot of people do that no more. But we learned when we had authority. The, uh, uh, God, this plate, um, make sure that it's, it's, it ain't going to harm me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't care what happened, mm -hmm. whether you believe it or not. The world shifts to make sure that that prayer comes, comes to pass. Mm -hmm. Because it recognizes your authority. Yeah. We don't teach this. It recognizes your authority. I can lay hands on people and they're healed because I recognize the authority that was been given to me. And I operate in confidence in that. I can pray, listen, you got charge over the angels. Did you know that? Did you know that? That God, the scripture, oh, we're going to talk about this next week. The scripture says you've been, given, you've been crowned with glory and honor, lower than the angels, but have authority over the angels. Does, not, it, does the scripture say that? Lower than the angels, but you've been crowned with glory and honor with authority over them. So I can say, as I'm going out of town, angels, I need you to surround this car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. No wrecks in this future. Yeah. I don't care what the enemy has planned to happen to me today. Angels, I need you to, in campus, they say, in, in campus that's what that means. Surround me. Yes. Protect me. I put you on assignment today. Yes. You know you have authority over your finances. Because yes. finances is a world-made thing. And God says you have authority over all world made things. So you can look at your bank account and be like, look, in the name of Jesus, I need this, I need this number to be higher. 
in the name of Jesus with authority of heaven. Can you can you take the wealth of the wicked and deposit that into my account? Watch this. Watch this. Y'all look at me crazy. The rest of the scripture I just read and I'm done. The rest of the scripture I just read. He said you will be able to do greater works than these and I will do whatever you ask in my name. It says, so that the father may be glorified in the son. So he said, if you ask me and take authority over some things, not just for not for your glory, but you're doing it for my glory. Meaning if I lay hands on my account to put more money in it, it's for me to sow more. It's for me to have more room to sow. And if God says, if that's your reason, he says, I will answer your prayer. If you ask in my name, I will do it because it gives glory to God. We don't read. Everybody stand to your feet. We don't read enough. Somebody celebrate the Lord for the authority he's given us. One thing. Oh, yeah, I got a lot coming next week. One thing Jesus said that, that really blew me away. It was in Luke Let me go to it. The Lord said, Occupy until I return. That was in Luke 19. Jesus told a parable about a king who was going away. And he said in this parable that he he bestowed upon those, his servants, a gift. And he told them to invest it. And he used the words occupy, make it greater, multiply it. And he was telling this story to tell, to tell us, listen, I'm going to the Father but I need you to represent me here in the earth and not just do what I do, but do greater and spread that thing around. So if I came here and I took authority over the earth, I need you to do the same and do much more and do much more and do much more. Somebody yell out much more. He gave a few instructions. Matthew 10, 7 through 8. I'm just going to read these really quickly. It says, here's your instruction. God said, go and preach, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely I gave you. What he was saying is, this is Jesus. This ain't nobody else. Jesus said, I... Here's your instruction. Go out and teach this message. And I'm going to have signs follow you. So be encouraged to lay hands on people. Heal the sick. Speak to the dead. Now, that's what we don't do because we we don't teach this. Speak to the dead. Somebody dying? God says you have authority to walk into a hospital room and say, get up. We don't have a lot of believers walking around in hospitals because they don't know their authority. If we knew that, you know how many believers would be walking around hospitals today? They're going to have to kick us out. I'm praying that that shifts. I'm praying that they have people on call, that they have believers on call. When somebody flatlines, there should be a button. Boop, get a believer in here. folk laughing but I'm dead serious though because that's what it says this isn't a fantasy story this y'all know the bible is not put in the fiction section the bible is actually put in in the history section did you know that that the bible is labeled as a historical document historical documents are labeled as true if the world didn't believe this was true, why would they put it in the history section? 
the history section says these are things that really happen. These are things that are really true. If they didn't believe that, if the unbelievers didn't believe that this word was true, then they would have put it in the fiction section. I believe it. He says, go cleanse the people, cleanse the lepers. Those who are sick, man, lay hands, cast out demons. There are a lot of demons roaming around. And, and the scripture says you have authority to cast them out. Hear me. When someone starts, starts acting out of character and you realize like, oh, that's not true. We say it like, oh, I don't know what that was, but that ain't you. Demon. Spirit. Am I lying? Where's our? Yes. That's how you recognize it. When someone, because if you, especially if you know somebody and they like acting different. It's the Bible says you have the authority to, to arrest that thing. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. This attitude, you never got that. Come out, up and out, yeah, up and out. Yeah. Up Leave her alone. This yeah. depression, God didn't give you depression. God didn't give you depression. You have authority to say to yourself, oh, ooh, why do I feel like I want to kill myself? Uh-uh, uh-uh. Up and out, up and out, up and out, up and out. Up and out. You got to go. You don't belong here. You don't belong here. When you start operating in that authority, demons know who you are. And they submit to that authority just like Paul. Like, I know who you are. I know who you are. Don't let a demon say, I don't know who you are. Don't let a spirit say, I don't know who you are. Don't let depression say, I don't know who you are. Don't let suicide say, I don't know who you are. You have to operate in that authority yeah. I'm telling you if we start operating in our kingdom authority the whole game changes the whole game changes so that's your homework assignment this week take authority take authority don't be timid Kingdom people aren't timid. We walk different. We talk different. We, we. Kingdom people shut it down. Anything that's not like God, we shut it down. Relational problems, they call. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take authority over this situation we got. In the mighty name of Jesus, there, there will be reconciliation here. Amen. Click. It sounds strange, but we're but the Bible describes us as peculiar. We do a lot of weird stuff because we understand that the world doesn't abide. I mean, that the world abides by what we say. The Bible says, the Bible says, the earth groans and is eagerly waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. The earth groans and is eagerly waiting to be led by you. Waiting. The earth. Earth. If you planning on a, on a on a cookout and you don't want it to rain, <laughs> peculiar, very peculiar. But I've seen it written multiple times in this word where they commanded the weather. Jesus didn't like it raining. Uh uh. Peace be still. Peace be still. Joshua was fighting the battle. He was like, uh-uh, if it get dark, it's going, we're going to lose. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Son, you stay. You stay for another 12 hours until this battle's over. Is that not what happened? Authority. It is literally, okay. It is, watch this. It is found out. It's another message. It is, if you look at the history of the world, just hearing that story, then we're done. If you look at the history of the world and the rotation of the earth around the sun, look it up, look it up, look it up. We are literally 12, 12 hours behind where we're supposed to be. And there's only one account that is written that explains why we're behind 12 hours. One story, and it's in the Bible, that Joshua took command over the day. 
If, we, if it gets dark, we're going to lose. I need you to stay. And it says God heard his cry and held the sun in the sky for another 12 hours. Yeah. Look it up. This is historical document. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Woo, we all, oh, I'm so excited about this, uh, this series. That was such an amazing message, right? Right. Thank you so much for joining us today and showing your love and support. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video with your family, friends, and loved ones. And for more information on how to connect, give, and get involved, all you have to do is download our app, TSNB Church, or visit our website, www.tsnbchurch.com. Well, that concludes our time here today. We hope you enjoyed it. We love you, and we can't wait to see you next week. Peace.